going just a second here. All right, welcome everyone to the Badger Dairy Insights, a part of the UW-Madison Division of Extension's Farm Ready Research Series. Um, we'd like to thank you for taking time out of your day to join us. I'm Melissa Seafelt, the Extension Dairy and Livestock Educator for Eau Claire County. Um, today, we're going to be discussing the dairy brain, making financial sense of your farm's data. And before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the team that's helped put together today's session. Um, we have Amanda Young, Dairy and Livestock Educator for Dodge County. Elena Voss, Agriculture Educator for Juneau and Sauk Counties, and along with all the other Extension Educators and Specialists that have been helping put together all the sessions in the Badger Dairy Insight Series. And with that, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Victor Cabrera. Um, Dr. Cabrera is a Professor and Extension Professional um, in Dairy Management at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Dairy Science Department. Dr. Cabrera combines applied research, interdisciplinary approaches, and participatory methods to deliver practical, user-friendly, and scholarly um, decision support tools for dairy farm management. Uh, during his career, Dr. Cabrera has developed more than 40 excuse me, decision support tools, uh, published more than 70 refereed articles and nine book chapters, and has given numerous talks at extension meetings throughout Wisconsin, other states, and countries. And with that, Dr. Cabrera. Thank you. Thanks to all the team uh, for making this possible. We are very, very excited to share what we have been doing in the Dairy Brain Project. So this is a great, great opportunity. Uh, I would like to start saying that this is uh, very, as you can see in the screen, very interdisciplinary project. We have people from computer science, data science, and as you may find more familiar, uh, dairy and animal sciences as well. So the title uh, that we have put together for this presentation is the UW Dairy Brain Project, a continuous data-driven, I think that's a very important term there, decision-making engine. And just, uh, I would mention quickly here, you have in the bottom of the screen here, our website, and we try to keep up to date what we are doing in this project, dailybrain.wisc.edu. We are very privileged in this project to count with uh, probably the most diverse and the most progressive dairy farms uh, in the US and I may say even in the world. And the nice thing is, as we approach these farmers, they are very willing to collaborate with us. That implies that they will share their data, their management and their knowledge with us. Uh, they become on board and they become part of our project and what we are calling also the coordinated innovation network, like an advisory committee of the project. So that's very exciting. That's very great. and. A unique resource we have in Wisconsin for this Dairy Brain project. The other thing that's unique as well from our project is that we count uh, with access to one of the premier sites of uh, interdisciplinary research in UW campus, the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery. Several members uh, from our team actually reside in this building and our data physically actually is collected and saved in uh, in the large the larger the largest um, server network of the university, which is in the basement of this uh, building. And the next thing I want to share with you is the fact that if I would ever be asked to describe or summarize our project in one slide, uh, this would be the one to do so. Uh, we have at the center, this dairy brain. Uh, we have tried to coin this logo. And the interesting thing is that we are looking for this ongoing process that is uh, circular here. Um, that means that this is an evolving process and a continuous process. And we don't expect that we're gonna reach an end anytime soon. This is gonna be a continuous 
improvement and learning from us, from the farmers, from the industry. And let me tell you a little bit more what it consists, this Dairy Brain project. The first step in the whole process is collect data from farms. And then uh, bring all those data from multiple sources to a central location. I mentioned before, this uh, Wisconsin Institute for Discoveries where the data resides, but that's only uh, a step in the right direction because after that, the data needs to be transformed and harmonized. And this, uh, believe me, is at the moment, the largest bottleneck we have in the project because we all know the data from farms is not clean. Uh, there are a lot of missing data, a lot of noisy data. And besides, there are several, several different vendors on the farm that provide and generate data uh, continuously. And those data sources don't talk to each other. So connecting the data sources is uh, a big, a challenge, but also a big motivation of this project. But then actually our goal is on the left part of this slide is apply these analytical services to the data. Once we have the data clean and ready to be analyzed, uh, it is a very exciting moment in which we can uh, use our scientific knowledge to apply to the data and uh, bring new insights that would not be available if the data would not be available at that point. And then uh, because that's very interesting from the research standpoint of view, that doesn't mean uh, that will be directly applied on the farm. So we have another component here on top that we need to demonstrate this value added from the information uh, in order for the farmers to actually apply and have and take actions on the farm based on the information that comes from the whole system. And indeed, Part of that process would be to re recollect feedback from these farmers to improve the whole process and repeat the process as we go. As I was saying at the beginning, it's an ongoing process and a continuous process. And this is the main motivation of the whole uh, Dairy Brain project. Uh, I'm pretty sure you will find this very familiar in the dairy industry. We call this the dairy data ecosystem. And as you can see here, there are silos of separated data sources. Uh, we have the feed that probably comes from a software, like for example, feed management, feed supervisor, uh, genetic information could come from uh, in light, for example. Just to give some examples that occur to me, the milking system will require all the information that is from the robotic system or uh, uh, rotatory system or whatever system the farm is using to milk uh, harvest milk from the cows. There are sensors in many of the farms nowadays. Uh, some farms uh, could have uh, weather stations, or even if the farm doesn't have this data, will come from different other sources, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The point I'm trying to make here is that all these data sources normally are reside in their own silos and they don't talk to each other. Uh, therefore, what we want to do is actually bring all this data, like using a funnel here and put together in what we're calling the agricultural data hub and get this data ready to be analyzed and actually provide insights uh, and value added, as I mentioned before, in these decision support tools. Uh, but always, this is an important point here to have a lock there in which the access to the data and the information should be permissioned by the generators of the data, finally, the farmers would have the, the option to provide that access to their own personal managers, et cetera, et cetera. But it needs to be uh, clearly defined how that will work as we reach that level. Uh, many of you who know the work we have been doing in my lab, uh, throughout the year, we have developed these decision support tools that haven't been connected with the data. So this is like a, the next like logical step, but very challenging uh, to, to mention it, uh, in which we can have these decision support tools at a higher level with more uh, sophisticated algorithms, but not only that, connected directly with the data that are being generated already on the farms. And one more thing I will mention here is the fact that different farms will have different 
vendors and different systems in the farm and different amounts of data. The, the concept and the idea and the work of the dairy brain will work regardless. If they have more data or less data, uh, we believe and we're convinced in any farm there would be the possibility to add value by using better the data. And you're gonna see in a moment how we can do that in other farms like uh, this extension program we have, we call the data money and Liliana is kind of giving you uh, a very good background about that after my talk. So our strategy is basically follow these four steps of our main aims or goals of the project. On the bottom here, create and nurture what we call the coordinated innovation network. And this is, uh, as I mentioned before as well, like an advisory committee that's guiding us throughout all the steps into the future. Uh, uh, we have engaged uh, a number of people on that role, more than a hundred at the moment. Liliana is in charge actually to uh, uh, work with them and facilitate that process. And they are helping us developing uh, articles. Uh, for example, last year we published five articles in Hortz Dairyman. And at the moment we are working on, on several other articles uh, or more in-depth articles about data governance, data sharing, data collection, data utilization on the farms. Then in number two here, we have uh, uh, what I mentioned as well, the creation of this agricultural data hub in which we're gonna recite physically all the data that we are collecting on each one of the farms we're working with. In the third point here, and the third objective is build the actual dairy brain, as we call it, which would be this suite of analytical modules, uh, decision support tools and algorithms that will provide additional insights from the collected data. And on top here is our extension program. And we try to disseminate and we really appreciate the opportunity to have this talk, for example, or this a uh, couple of talks in this session to promote, uh, gain awareness of the community in general of what we are doing, what we can offer and uh, how we can collaborate together towards those uh, ends. So only briefly here, I know there is a lot of stuff in this slide, but the, the the bottom line I would like to mention here is that we have at the center this agricultural data hub that's going to be physically where the data is being collected. And from there, we will have the data flowing to the dairy brain, where we have this analytical suite like uh, models and uh, simulation, optimization, algorithms that will provide information to these dashboards or decision support tools for decision making. But Nothing of this will happen if we would not have here this coordinated innovation network that will help us to shape all this work. Obviously, the farms and the farms are very important in the whole process and they will decide, and I mentioned this and I would like to mention again, uh, the fact that they are in our mind, the owners of the data. So they need to decide how that flows throughout the whole system. Actually, for example, in the whole system, we're gonna have the opportunity to allow other innovators, other companies, other universities, other researchers who would be willing and able to use the data to provide additional insights of the whole system. And I think that's a way to foster innovation within the main core of our project. One thing I wanted to share also briefly here is the fact that, uh, uh, in other domains, like for example here uh, in the smartphone domain, as we are all very familiar nowadays, we have apps and you probably find these icons in the screen very familiar. In my case, for example, I can track my activity uh, and the use of calories, and some health uh, parameters of myself by using, uh, in this case, iPhone and Apple Watch, for example. But there are several things, examples like this. The point I wanna make here is the fact that if I give permission to these apps to talk among each other, they do for the most part. 
uh, indeed, it's very efficient, this system, right? I can share my uh, blood pressure data with the activity data and my information about um, activity running, for example, I can share with uh, the calorie intake and I can put all together and I have a very nice summary and dashboard of what's going on here. And I, I would like, I can share all this information actually with a, a clinic, for example. I mean, the point is, this works. Uh, if we would go, for example, to the bank information, uh, works as well as here uh, in a different domain with a, a, even a higher level of security in some cases. The point is, this is a different domain than dairy, but when I want in dairy farming, just connect the data from the feed with the milking parlor, I encounter a lot of barriers and uh, walls in between to do that. And big part of what we're trying to do in the dairy brain is break those barriers and make available the data from one system to the other in an effective manner without disclosing uh, the confidentiality, taking care about the ownership of the data and all those issues that come along with the sharing of the data among all these systems. So there are examples and we should tap into them. We shouldn't copy them because they are different domains, but I think we can at least learn of what's going on in other domains. I mentioned that one of the objectives of the project is to create and nurture this coordinated innovation network. I mentioned also that uh, we have um, put together a nice group of more than a hundred people and uh, even before COVID, we were meeting regularly. Uh, during COVID, we met uh, uh, remotely as it's nowadays common. But the idea is we maintain an engaged group of stakeholders from US mostly, but there are a lot of people from Europe, Australia, and even other parts of the world that are collaborating uh, in this idea. Uh, in, and I mean, they share the same goals as we do. And with them, as I mentioned as well, uh, we have created last year these uh, five articles in Horst Derriman. And um, it's, it's a very nice um, uh, piece of work that we have done with them. This is a very collaboration, uh, collaborative, collaborative effort. And I think it's a good start for the next level we're gonna be doing with them, developing more in-depth articles. At the moment, in order to actually uh, have feedback in this work, uh, we are uh, working uh, on a survey. We have developed a questionnaire. The questionnaire is available. Uh, if you do happen to have a, a scanner on your phone, uh, if you scan this figure here, or, or simply if you go to the dairybrain.wisc.edu, uh, and if you're willing to spend 15 minutes responding some, uh, important questions about data in dairy farming, uh, we would appreciate very much. So here are the design documents we are planning. Uh, the topics may change, but these are the main topics we are uh, working uh, regarding the uh, work we are doing with the Coordinated Innovation Network. Now, I'm not gonna talk about much about extension because I know Liliana is gonna take a, a full presentation about extension and one program very important we have within extension that we are calling data money. But I just wanna mention that extension is an important part uh, of our dairy brain project. And it is a multi-touch, multifactorial extension uh, system. And we're trying to do uh, all what we can to gain awareness of our project. Um, unfortunately, COVID uh, has affected our ability to expand more as we would like at the moment, but uh, we appreciate opportunities like this one to do so. Then we have this agricultural data hub, as I mentioned, this is the physical uh, step of bringing all the data that requires collecting the data, harmonizing the data, store the data in one place very securely, and then distribute uh, with permission access the data. So 
that's a very technical part of the project, but a critical one. Uh, without this, we cannot uh, move forward. And actually, I want to give you just a brief idea what implies all this. We have different uh, data systems on the farm, like the feed, the milking parlor, the genomic, this, for example, in light, in soedis. We have the health information uh, management of the farm. And then all that come to our computer. Then we need to access first the data. Then we need to decode the data and put in separate uh, bins, separate types of data. Then we need to clean the data, very important on agricultural data in general. And then we need to homogenize the data. So regardless of from where or what system comes the original data, at the end, for example, all the feed data, regardless of the system on the farm, should be equivalent to be used on our analytical process in a permanent way. One thing that's critical in the whole project is that we are not trying to merge data sets to do one analysis. We are trying to continuously have this merging of data sets as the data are being generated. And then we need to do uh, this merging that we call integrating and basically have all the data of feed, milking, for example, and the <clears throat> processing data all together in just one place and available ready for doing analysis and decision supports uh, at the moment the farm requires. So then we come to the top level part of the project, which is per se the dairy brain uh, and the development of this decision support tool that we can categorize if we would uh, in descriptive, prescriptive, uh, predictive and prescriptive decision support tools. At the lower level, these descriptive are the very useful dashboards that we are very um, used to see on farms, for example, uh, like a curve, how the milking is changing every day, what's the, uh, <clears throat> the production today with respect to yesterday and things like that, which is very interesting, very important. It does not require though very sophisticated algorithms. The predictive goes beyond because now we need to project to the future. And in order to do so, we need some level of simulation modeling and historical data that informs that. And every time we have new data, we will improve our prediction power. And at the top of the line, there will be these prescriptive uh, models or tools that actually will suggest management actions. It will, they will try what's the optimal uh, <clears throat> action at one point in time and they will suggest that to the farmer to do so. Like for example, should I call or not this animal? Should I breed or not at the moment this animal? Or what type of semen should I use at this moment for this particular animal? And the farmer could follow or could not follow that. And actually that will even bring an extra level here in which we can compare what has been the action of the farmer compared with the suggested action and what has been the consequences, what have been the consequences of that after time. At, at the end, what we wanna show and demonstrate is that doing this will bring an added value to the farm. So we have uh, a number of tools planned for the next couple of years, let's say. And this will come in different levels, as I mentioned before, in the short term would be this operational, more like a descriptive tools. Then in the midterm, the tactical tools uh, that are a little more sophisticated. And in the long term, the strategic that would be more the prescriptive kind of tools. And here are some examples, as I mentioned before, like for example, on the top part of the table, these short term operational tools uh, could be as simple as, for example, providing daily feed efficiency to the farmer. That's critical and very important information. And But believe it or not, uh, most of the farmers don't have that information on a daily and permanent basis on the farm. They may be able to calculate when they require, but they will need to print or bring files from different sources and make, do, make it mostly manually. 
If we go a little further on this, uh, the daily milk income or feed cost is a very valuable key performance indicator, for example, that we are pretty sure farmers will appreciate to have at the fingertips every time they want. Have an app on the iPhone or, or the smartphone and just see how the, the milk income or feed cost is changing every single day could give a good idea of how to control the margins every single time, for example. Then if we go in the middle here, more midterm tactical tools, for example, we can use some machine learning algorithms to find out what are the traits that could potentially help us to identify or reduce clinical mastitis on animals. That's more like a prediction. And we can find out by, for example, looking the milking parlor data, uh, what would be the chance or the risk of a cow getting uh, sick two, three days in advance, and maybe we can do some uh, uh, intervention ahead of time. Or we can do the next thing here. We can actually project what would be the net present value of a cow, and that will give us a good idea, for example, of replacement decisions with animals that in most of the cases nowadays is being done uh, in a non-systematic way on farms. That will require a lot of data that needs to be connected in real time as it is being generated on the farm. And then on the bottom here, we will have, uh, for example, one example that we have uh, described a little more later on in this presentation is continuous nutritional accuracy. So basically the idea is that we think farmers have the opportunity to feed more accurate their cows by grouping better and by providing better diets, for example. But in order to do so, if they have an ex expert system and a decision support tool that inform on doing that, on moving cows uh, strategic, strategically uh, among pens, could do that and reformulate in the diets. If there is an ex expert system, as I was saying, will help them to actually do that. And uh, because we have found out that in some cases they don't do that because uh, they don't have the time to invest on doing this on a continuous basis. And the last point here, the last tool is this breeding uh, idea of using different type of semen and combine that with culling decisions. Uh, indeed, the idea would be to use the newest technologies, like for example, using sex semen at the same time of beef semen and using genomic tests on the animals, for example. What's the best policy, the best protocol that a farmer could do across time? And that obviously would be a farm specific decision making. So at this point, I would like to take just a moment uh, to respond to the poll question that's on top there. Now that I give you a brief description of these potential tools, I would like to ask you which of these tools possibly would be uh, the best or the right right now for you. Thanks, Amanda, for, for managing the, the poll. Which possible tool would be the most valuable for you right now? And you have the list there, daily feed efficiency or daily milk income or feed cost, selection of genetic traits, dy dynamic net present value of a cow, continuous nutritional accuracy, and or breeding genetic and culling decisions. And I think we're going to go ahead and close the poll. It looks like we've got about settled in where it's going to be. Great. Oh, this is very nice to see. So, uh, and actually, I, I will uh, take a little picture here for myself of the results. We have 50%, half of the people responding that daily feed efficiency or daily milk over feed costs would be the most valuable right now. That's interesting to know uh, because 
as I mentioned before, this doesn't, these tools doesn't require very sophisticated algorithms. They are very simple calculations. What they require is that we connect the data as the data are being generated on the farm. In second place, I see here breeding uh, genetic and culling decisions. That's also very interesting to find out because that's something we are planning to do. Indeed, uh, we were very glad to have a, uh, a second uh, site, I would say, grant uh, to have a PhD student that would be mostly dedicated to working on that specific uh, topic. In third place, we have the dynamic net present value of a cow, which is what we call the value of a cow. We have actually uh, spent some time on developing the code of the tool. We have it in the background and we are waiting anxiously to get the data ready to run the, the model. And then uh, in, in fourth place, the selection of genetic traits to the re reduce critical mastitis. And uh, that's also something we have been working. Uh, there are a few papers out there and, and work. Liliana has been working on that. Uh, you're gonna be hearing from Liliana in a moment. She's gonna be talking about extension at this time, but she has been working on that. And I can see the continuous nutritional accuracy is uh, with no responses. Okay, uh, anyway, I'm gonna share what we are doing in the continuous nutritional accuracy next. Thanks for responding to the, the poll. So this has been uh, published uh, last year and Jorge, uh, the senior author here was a master student on my lab. And the main idea of this whole project was to systematize and automatize the decision-making of grouping and providing different diets to groups of cows. And along those lines, it was also important to follow what the farm is doing, right? The idea is not to go to a farm and re really try to change their protocol, the work protocol or workflow by trying to do the groups. We, the idea is to try to work within what is already happening on the farm. And the other thing is, uh, besides the accuracy on the nutrition itself, is to avoid errors of grouping cows that we encounter as we were working on this that are very common uh, in the system. At least in the, in the farm, we work specifically with this. Uh, the bottom line is the cows would not always ended up in the destination group as they were assigned at the moment of being assigned. Okay, so here is the main concept. Uh, we have lots of lactating cows mostly that have very different requirements of nutrition, but we provide only one diet to all of them, right? One TMR, it works for many reasons but we think there is an opportunity actually to improve the efficiency of feeding by splitting a little bit the cows. It's not a big deal as you will see, splitting a little bit and providing a more accurate diet to each one of the groups, right? I mean, if we have like in this case, three cows and, and we're gonna give a diet to the three cows, for sure, maybe one of the cows will receive the exact diet that that cow needs, but there would be other two cows that would either we receive more or less of what they need. And I mean, for practical purposes, it does work. If we have groups, we need to give one diet to the group. But if we have a very large group, we will have the chance and the risk that a lot of these cows will be either under or overfed on that group, right? So this is what happens on the farm we work for this paper. So. Uh, there are about 2,400 lactating cows. And what they do is they move the cows every Monday night, between Monday night and Tuesday early morning. They have some automatic gates that help on that. And the list has been done uh, mostly by hand and some screenshots from the systems in the farm. So there is a lot of, I would say, subjectivity on, on putting the cows on different pens, but there are some, uh, as you will see, uh, some uh, 
systematic uh, concepts to do that. Like for example, uh, they have uh, 14 pens, okay? And they will have some pens with only, uh, for example, early, uh, early postpartum primiparous cows, and they will have all other pens only with peak lactation on primiparous and only peak lactation on multiparous. That's very common on the dairy farms. But if you see here a little closer on the data, for example, this is the distribution of cows in the peak lactation of the multiparous cows. And you can see there are a lot of uh, what's called outliers. Uh, these cows that are in a very different days in milk that they should to belong to the peak lactation. And that's what I was saying. There are certain inconsistencies because the way how the system works and they are in a hurry to move the cows and they need to do that every week and they don't have a systematic way an expert system that will tell you more clearly how to move the cows, okay? Because as we know, when we move a cow from one pen to another, we are creating a space and we need the space for another cow and another pen. Uh, kind of the problem uh, persists across pens. But beyond that, here's what they do for diets for these groups. As you can see for the peak lactation, which is surprising here, uh, for primiparous and multiparous, you can see they have only one diet and the diet here is only uh, just for, for uh, displaying purposes, only expressed in megacals per kilo. So net energy of lactation. So for example, they provide 1.77 megacals per kilo of diet uh, dry matter for the peak lactations in multiparous and 173 for the peak lactation on primiparous, just to give you an example, okay? Uh, but the other thing that they do is they, the diets are standard. Even though the cows are changing each one of the pens, this diet 1.77, for example, mega cows for multiparous peak will be the same across time, no matter which cows are there, right? And the other thing, if they reformulate and they do a few times a year, they do it only because the price of the diet ingredients change, not because uh, they change the amount on the diet. So they try to be consistent with this amount for the peak lactation, for example, right? So the diets, bottom line, the diets are not based on the requirements. So if we see the data uh, in this nice diagram of net energy on the x-axis and metabolizable protein on the y-axis, you can see there is a lot of variability on the requirements. These are the requirements per cow uh, on these 480 cows that belong to the peak multiparous cows. So there are three pens. Each pen has about 160 cows, total about 480 cows, but they all receive the same diet. And the same diet is about here where I'm trying to mark the solid circle here. Uh, they need to do that because they want to have enough nutrients on the diet to support those high producing cows. Makes sense. The proposition we are trying to do is, since you already have three pens, why not split in three different levels of nutrition these cows, as you can see here in blue, green, and red, and each one of those will have a little different diet. And you can see one of the diets potentially will be hotter with more nutrients than the current one, but the other two diets will be much lower. And if we would average the three diets, the nutrients that we'll be providing to these 480 cows will be much less than what they are providing at the moment. So as you can see, that has a lot of benefits. The first one may be saving cost on the feed and still cows will be fed uh, to the nutrient requirements for the most part but also that will about avoid uh, over conditioning of the cows, for example, and metabolic problems in the next lactation. So what Jorge did in this research is actually uh, connect data from at least two sources, hair management data, dairy comp specifically in this case, and feed management uh, on the farm. And they need to be connected in this case by these two attributes, pen ID and date. Okay, and that's not all because these two need to be connected with some level of data form formulation uh, software or 
algorithm. Actually, we can develop the algorithm, the optimization to create the new diet formulation here. But all this needs to be permanently done, continuously done. So every week, the farm could have the new diets and the list of the cows that should belong to each one of the pens. And that will become a decision support tool that they can tap every Monday, for example, they will have the list. And what the major change would need be, would be to actually change a little bit the diets, formulate a couple more of diets in some cases. So this is our proposal. And as you can see here, it's not much different. Uh, we are trying to respect what the farm is doing already, right? So we have 14 pens here. A proposal is for each pen that has about 160 cows each to provide one diet. You can see the diets, if you compare this with the previous slide, they haven't changed too much. But now, for example, for the peak lactation and first and later lactation, each one of the groups will have a different diet. Small numbers here would make a huge difference overall. The other thing that you will see here, there will be very, very little or small number of misclassified cows, if any, indeed, okay? Uh, we try to follow what the farm that does and the diets were not uh, reformulated every week, but that could be done. If that's done, this would even bring more savings and net return from the proposal. And, uh, but what we are proposing here that cows could be moved a little bit better according to the requirements. Therefore, the diets would be better allocated to those cows. And if we see the numbers, actually, here we can demonstrate that there is a value of doing this, right? And if we, let's take a look only for a moment to the peak lactation of the first lactation animals and peak on the uh, uh, multiparous cows. As you can see here, there is a difference. And even though there is a negative value, meaning that the diet of one of the three pens is higher with our proposal, the other two diets are lower and they are positive. And the same in, in primiparous as in multiparous. Therefore, there is a value. We are saving money here on the diet. We are not considering here improve of milk productivity, but we expect that. We assume that there will not be improvement in the milk because uh, we didn't have enough data to show that or to make the case, but the literature shows that potentially we should be expecting improved productivity. That would be a much higher gain here even. The other thing I wanna comment in this slide is like, for example, in pen number 14 here, which is late in lactation, uh, actually our proposed practice had a much higher cost of the diet than the current practice. And so here there would be, there was a big negative value when we compare our proposal with the farm and that's because we believe on that case, those cows are actually being uh, underfed indeed in the system. Actually, if we would delete here, we will assume we do exactly the same as the farm, our gains would be more than double of what we are showing here. So point I'm making is our estimates here are very conservative and still valuable enough to consider this option. And now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit uh, to another uh, tool that we are we have uh, in mind to develop next. And this is uh, gladly is something that came uh, in, in a good place in the poll as a potential tools to develop. And here the idea is to use all the technologies, the newest technologies together to better have a, a policy of better reproduction on the farm, reproduction and calling actually together, right? Using sex semen, beef semen, conventional if needed, and also use a genomic test 
if as needed. So the idea is optimize the decisions of breeding, genetic selection, and culling policies for maximum profitability, but not only now, but in the long term. So this requires an interactive, dynamic, and highly integrated decision support tool. So we need all the data together, and we need, uh, in this case, a little sophisticated algorithm behind. For the user at the end, they will, it will be just like a normal decision support tool where they will be able to see what's the best action they could take at any point in time they need to make a decision. So this is prescriptive, meaning that the framework should be able to propose the best course of action and the farmer could follow or not, but then uh, there would be always uh, a line of potential best decision that could be taken depending on the situation of the farm. And so here is our, I would say, uh, primary uh, overview and conceptual framework of this. Uh, first of all, we have improved reproductive performance. I mean, uh, and this is not new, uh, some years already, oversupply of replacements. And that has triggered, in many cases, a greater use of beef semen. With the same, uh, but not only because of that, because also there has been an attractive price for crossbreed beef animals from the dairy industry, which is a great thing. So there is increased demand of beef crossbreds because of this attractive price that seems to be, it will continue still with time. And if we actually provide for the beef industry good quality animals, they, it seems to be that uh, that will become part of the dairy business enterprise, the production of crossbreed calves, okay? But every time we wanna use more beef semen, also that has relationship with the use of sex semen, right? Or one or the other. Or if we wanna use more sex semen, it's gonna give us more room to use beef semen at the same time. But along those lines, there is the idea of using genomic tests. That's very popular. Many farms are using our farm from the, the university has been using genomic tests in all the animals for many, many years already. That gives the opportunity to not only make decisions later in life for the animals, but at the very beginning, if the test is, is being done uh, when born or shortly after, uh, it is possible to actually select the best animals that will be raised, not to raise all the animals. I mean, but if we wanna have some room for uncertainty to raise a little more animals, we could use different type of semen with those animals as well. The idea is we wanna look for genetic progress at the same time that we improve profitability and sustainability of the whole system. And there are, uh, fortunately, from other uh, labs, some research going on on this area. So we wanna tap on the knowledge that has been already gained and create our own uh, model and decision support tool that will help producers to do better decisions in this area. So at the moment, it's a conceptual framework, but uh, I think a great area in which we're gonna be moving forward. And here is some preliminary analysis from uh, Wen Li, uh, a student who finished uh, last year uh, a master degree in, in my lab. I mean, depending on what strategy we do, we would have a different level of uh, genetic progress, let's say. On the y-axis here, we have the net merit and on the x-axis timeline, right? So for example, the projected top sires in the industry are going in this direction, the dark uh, straight line on top. But uh, depending on what we use, we can have different levels of genetic progress, whether we use sex semen and beef semen together with culling extra female calves, or if we use conventional semen and cooling any extra female calves, or if we are using conventional semen and cooling any extra fingers, for example. So there would be a number of potential decisions here. The point is we wanna try to get 
the most closer to the projected top size, uh, obviously it will be lower always because of the genetic reasons, obviously, but we, we want to get a very straightforward and a good way to keep up with the genetic progress on the herd. And we can do that by selecting a number of decisions that we have currently available on the industry. And with that, I just want to finish up uh, giving thanks to our funding support uh, from the USDA that's gonna allow, is allowing us to, to move forward in this project. And actually before that, we had uh, another grant from the University of Wisconsin that we should acknowledge as well within the initiative they call the UW 2020 initiative. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Victor. Um, I don't think I've seen any messages or questions come in through the chat, um, but I had a question for you when you were talking about um, barriers between different, um, you know, companies that are helping feed into the um, data. You know, what what kinds of um, barriers do those companies have with sharing info currently, or or with those um, sources kind of talking with each other? Is it just in some of the coding? I mean, how, how easy are those problems to, to fix to help facilitate this process that you're working on? That, I, I think that's a great question, Lisa. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, it, it is, I, I would say it's a, it's a challenge uh, issue. Uh, we have encountered, and I, I would talk by experience, uh, every different company in the spectrum. There are some that are extremely willing and helpful and able. It's not only, uh, I mean, there, there are several characteristics that need to be there. They need to be willing, they need to be able and capable to actually share the data. There are some companies that are very willing to share the data, but they don't have the facilities to share efficiently the data, for example. And there would be other group of, of companies that are more reluctant to share uh, their data. And that, that, would be, uh, that would be dependent on, uh, on many factors of the company itself. I would say in general, I mean, and, and I should rephrase, it's, it's, it's also to be debated whose data is. Uh, and, and, and depending on what's the level of processing of the data, it could be farms data or companies data. Uh, in general, what we have found is companies are very willing to work and collaborate on this. But we all understand it is a delicate issue and we need to find ways, and the Coordinated Innovation Network is working on that, finding ways in which uh, it is a win-win situation for everyone, including the farmers, including the companies, including the researchers, and, and we think there are ways to do so. Great, thank you for that. Um, not seeing any more questions in the chat, so we'll just give that a second, make sure there wasn't something coming in. Um, I'm, I'm gonna be here and, until the end. I mean, if there are questions afterwards as well, we can tackle all together. Great. Yeah, not seeing anything more coming into the chat. So I think we're going to um, switch gears. And um, I would like to introduce uh, Liliana Fadul. Um, she is the animal scientist that's currently uh, working as a research associate um, in Dr. Cabrera's lab. Um, and as part of the Dairy Brain Project team, uh, Liliana completed her PhD at the University of Laval in Quebec, Canada. And there she recognized uh, the potential use of data science techniques to help identify problems and offer solutions in the animal science field in learning and exploring um, these applied techniques, particularly in dairy farms uh, became her true passion. And at the Dairy Brain Project, Liliana is integrating different dairy uh, data streams uh, generated on and off farm. And she's going to be talking to, with us a little bit today about data money. So with that, Liliana. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. And yes, I'm gonna talk about today about data money. So data money, what is data money? So data money is like Victor already kind of mentioned, it's an extension program 
uh, that is part of the Dairy Brain project that it's going to assess and promote improved decision making by using integrated data streams in dairy farms. So, okay, I need to, okay, there you go. So, as, um, as just to put you again, where are we with this uh, uh, data monitor extension program? Uh, you already have seen this uh, slide before in Victor's presentation, but it's just, um, so we are here like in the top of the finally, or the final strategy or the complementary strategy um, of, the, of the dairy brain as the extension program. Mm. Um, so here is more a global or a visualization about like the data money. So the data money want to kind to do like an exercise or like in, in real time, um, what are like the benefits of data integration and what can you do with the data integration or the data usage to develop or use um, decision support tools at the farm. So with these, um, program, we want to involve uh, farmers, agents, uh, extension agents, advisor, industry, like the whole um, people that are like involved with the, with the dairy industry. So we wanted to do seminars, webinars, and workshops um, to show like what is, what are we doing and we can, what we can do also with the data that you have at your farms. And that's the part that the demonstration and facilitation, um, come in. And also of course, with the promotion of what we are doing as part of the, of the, of the big project that is the dairy brain in this case. So here in this slide, we are going to see how like some of the main steps of what it's needed to be in the dairy brain, in the data money. Uh, program. So we normally started with a um, dairy brain meeting. So it's more like um, what is the project? So it was like just a presentation that Victor did. Um, and we show also like some of the of the decision support tools that we all are we are developing. Um, the next part is kind of the first uh, meeting with the farm team and of course the dairy brain team. So it's kind of an introduction of um, what is available at the farm, what is the data sources that are um, generated at the farm or are available at the farms, and kind of set goals. What are like, what we can do, what, what are the priorities of the farmers, um, what are they interested in develop, or do they have the data available to do it? So it's kind of an assessment of the current situation of the data at the farm. Uh, normally in the second meeting, what we do is like we start to do like a planning process about what are like the priorities that um, were defined like in the first meeting. So we can normally we work, we have a, a document. So there are like different set goals. So maybe the farmer wants to start with the, with, I don't know, we have three goals, we want to start with the second one. So just like to know where are we going to go for the next uh, meetings or the next period of time. And so, 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 and then the third and the next fourth, fifth meeting, etc. There are going to be um, the these data exchange between the the farmer and the and the dairy brain team. Um, you're going to kind of start working and putting together these decision support tools. There is going to be feedback from the farmer and the advisor and the rest of the farm team that the farmer decide from the beginning or even like in the process. Um, there are gonna be revisions and we are gonna just continue the process on the priorities on the farm. So this whole story about the daily money, like we can say that officially started like last year, um, it was February, it was almost a year, yeah, in, in um, here in the pair in Wisconsin so we host a meeting where we talk again about the dairy brain. Um, we, I talk about a little bit of some mastitis, the um, tools that we were, I was working on. Um, and of course the data money program, um, we meet some of the farmers, we'll discuss everything. And that was kind of the first start of the, of the, um, of the data money. So Victor had already talked about this, but just, 
Um, so everyone is in the same page. So what we do, what we mean with data integration. So data integration is just the merging or like putting together different data sources. So for, for example, here in this slide, you're going to have um, milk production and for example, management, but it could be also feed. So for example, you got the feed efficiency. So that's kind of, it could be two, three, four, it doesn't matter the amount. It'd have to be just more than one data sources and that's going to be um, the data integration. So going back to the first meeting uh, of the data money, which is kind of just getting to know the farm team. And as I mentioned before, it's just like the data um, usage um, assessment of the farm. And one of the big questions that is in that first date is like the data integration used at the farm. So are they currently integrating? What are they currently integrating? Um, for what they are using the integrated data? Um, and before I start like continue telling what are we gonna do, like which of these um, data assessments, I just wanna go ahead with one of the pools that I have um, today. So since we're talking about the importance of data integration, um, I just wanna know what do you think about um, the data, if data integration is important to improve um, dairy farm management. So it's a yes, no question. So it's, if you really think that it's gonna change something in your decisions or in your management daily, weekly, monthly, doesn't matter um, by having these data, doesn't matter what which data source is just like the integration of it. Oh. That's nice. Seems that at least the ones that had vote will agree that the integration is is important. Yep, and I think we've settled out where it's going to end up. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. So yeah, we have hundred percent that said that effectively, really, yes. So that's okay. I'm just going to close here. There you go. So yeah, it was kind of a general answer. And the second question will be kind of, we know that it's important, but I just want, I'm curious if you're like currently right now using um, integrated data for decision making. Uh, if you're a farmer, if you're a consultant, um, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, this is moving fast. So right now we have mostly of the answers in no. But it's still going there. Okay. Yeah, so we said that mostly they are not currently. So we kind of know that this is important, but it's not currently being used. And that's not kind of a surprise since it's kind of, I guess I'm gonna stop sharing this now. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. Because it's, it's easy to say, but we know that it's hard to integrate different um, data sources um, since as Victor show is normally all separated by the software, but it's um, one of the important things to, to have. So if we continue with the data money and first meeting, so as, as I mentioned before, we are just gonna evaluate was what like, this is a really, like individual process and it's gonna depend um, like by each farm is gonna be different um, since not all data source, or not all the farm data, they have the same um, data sources. 
or they don't have the same goals or they are not interested in the same thing. So it's really like a, an individual or, or, or farm based process, which is also very interesting. So what we're going to do is just to analyze wh where is available at the farm, if they are integrating or not integrating, just, you know, and if they are integrating, what are the integration and what are like they are using um, the data for? That's going to be kind of one of the first steps. Then um, during like our questionnaire or like our, our based um, process that you're going to do the first time is like, what are like right now, like the current, um, they are currently making decisions with integrate data at the farm. What are the needs of data integration? Like if you have the option, what will be kind of your dream uh, integration data? Um, but also which decisions that you could be made that you're not making right now, if you had the option of these um, integrated data. So at the end, as I mentioned, is just have like the data use, usage assessment farm by each farm, like by each individual to just let us know um, what is the current status of the data usage um, at the farm. So by the end of the meeting or by the end of the first meeting, yeah, we're just gonna have like, what are the different goals from the farm? What is the usage on the, or the potentially um, data integration that can be done? What are gonna be kind of the benefits or like the applications of this data? And we are gonna set and prioritize the goals um, for the year of what we're gonna develop during that um, period. Um, so, for example, what kind of data um, can be used? So it's, I just put here some of the data that is normally available at the farm. So we have milk production, feed, management, health. Some of the farms have different sensors, financial data, economic data. Um, but at the end, it's like any dairy related data that the farm has available or could have available in the like potentially plans to collect in the in the near future. So what are, for example, the kinds of goals? So that's going to be again, it's going to be really individual and really based on on each of the goals that the farms had. So they're going to be, for example, anything that they want to improve performance or they want to know something um, like lactation curves of their of their cows by lactation, something like that, production, uh, management, um, decision-making um, about, for example, Victor talked about one of the different tools, but for example, when, um, if you need to cool a cow, like how do I know which cow could be better than the other one? Um, if you need some financial um, analysis or some goals, some budgeting stuff. Um, so again, is anything that it's gonna be, again, prioritized by the farm. That's gonna be based on each of the different farms. So what kind of tools? Victor show some of those, but we have, for example, in the feeding, we have the grouping, we have um, feed efficiency, we have income over feed cost. In the management part, we have, um, for example, the pregnancy rate. Uh, Victor also show about the usage of uh, sex semen um, the replacement, um, there is in the production, I mentioned the lactation curves, the decision-making replacement. Um, there are like a lot of different um, kind of tools that they could be developed with the, with the data um, that is available at the farm and what the, the farms really needs to be done. So um, this is also like kind of a nice that, I guess many of you has been asking. So this is really nice. There's a lot of work behind it, but how much time does this is going to require of my time? So again, this is a really self-directed process. Um, it's really individualized for each farm. So the farm is going to decide how often they want to meet. Um, we have been doing it typically every two months, every other month. So it's kind of, but if they want to meet, um, at the beginning more than less. It's it's really uh, something that is gonna be talk about it and it's gonna it's it's can be done uh, either way. And normally the meetings are two from 30 minutes to an hour. They are like really short meetings. 
and it's really is fine to get the feedback on the development of what we are working on the on the decision support tools and because we know that the farmers are busy and we just want to go like you know in the, it's, a, it's a process it's a sub directory process but we don't want to be like taking a lot of, uh, of your time um we had had some of the challenges i guess like like all the world in the last year um with the pandemic but i guess that for this case even if uh things are not rolling as fast as we expected um we also can we can say that we had like some opportunities in the sense that we can still do these webinars um virtual webinars or virtual meetings that um kind of allow us like to meet to, with the farmers with you right now that allow kind of participation from any time anywhere which is also kind of a, an advantage in this in this time um, so what are going to be like at the end of the process, the end results that are going to be there? So the farmer is going to have personalized data tools. Um, that the idea is like right now we are like doing this and it's going to be pretty easy in the sense that they are going to be pretty robust data tools, but they are going to be built, for example, in Google Sheets or something or Excel that, that it's really kind of a nice environment and can have access and if it will be it's very like interactive so for example if there's some tools that need to be updated for example monthly or daily if you just enter the data and then everything is going to run there so it's it's pretty nice um that is going to help with the decision making process and at the end all this process is just going to give like added value to the data um, of the farm of, of each of the farm um so with this, um, if anyone is interested in joining the program, um, just let us know. Um, Victor put the, um, the, the, the web page. Uh, also, you can contact, um, um, contact me or contact him or you know the around. Um, and with that, that's my email. And with that, I'm just gonna thank you for being here. Thank you, Liliana. Um, we did have a question in the chat that just related to, um, you know, getting involved. Um, you know, what kinds of information does a farm need to have to get involved? Are there any kind of minimum requirements that are there? Um, just maybe a little more detail about that. Yeah, well, not really. We don't have any, I guess, just having the data. Normally, all the farms have um, data so there is we don't have minimal requirements i guess the only thing is like um we will need to interchange data so we can work with the data of the farm um but it's just the willing to participate and to and to just you know it's just the willing to participate and to at least i guess maybe they will need to think um where are the goals so we just can help them um achieve them Hey, great. Um, not seeing any more questions in the chat at the moment. Um, we did have a request to drop the um, link to your website in the chat, so we'll try to do that quick. And if there's no other questions, um, we'd like to thank you for joining us today and uh, for the Badger Dairy Insight. Um, please do remember um, we'll be sending out an evaluation um, after this meeting and really appreciate any feedback that you can give us. And we also would like to remind you that there um, will be some additional farm ready uh, research webinars. The Badger Dairy Insight is part of that. Um, and so if you want to learn more about our webinars, um, do take a chance and go to the go.wisc.edu forward slash farm ready research and you can find out information about our upcoming sessions. We do run sessions for the Badger Dairy Insight every Tuesday uh, from 1 p.m. Uh, all the way through April. And our next session is going to be February 23rd and it's going to be uh, getting the most out of your forages. And we're gonna have some uh, discussion from Luis Ferrato and um, who's gonna be talking about 
the implication of prolonged corn silage storage. And then we'll also have Matt Akins, who will be talking a little bit on sorghum forage management. And then Kimberly Schmidt will be talking about feeding rye and triticale forages. And with that, again, everyone, thank you for joining us and stay warm out there. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Woohoo! We're done. And I apparently have been talking really fast all month whenever I've been like moderating things or teaching. I don't know why. It's all good. I feel like it's when been I'm a current talking, problem. <laughs> well, it's even worse when you talk with the mask on, I feel like. Like when I've had to teach with the mask on and go and see groups, I'm like, because <gasps> you're just like, <laughs> yeah, breathe. yeah, it's a different oh. airflow for sure. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, I hope it's okay that I did spotlight for the videos trying to help keep them where people 